Good morning, church. Good morning. It's good to hear all of y'all visiting with each other this morning. If you're visiting with us, we'd like uh, to have you fill out one of our visitor's cards. That's the little blue card right in front of you in the pew back. So if you'll take one of those and fill that out so we can have a record of your attendance and send you a, a letter, a card, or something just to let you know we appreciate you being here. And then stick around afterwards so we can visit and, and talk with you and just uh, introduce you to what a wonderful group of people we are. I want to share a passage of scripture out of Acts chapter 13 with you this morning, Acts chapter 13, and this is verse 47. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have sent you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. We carry with us everywhere we go an incredible, not only responsibility, but opportunity to provide a message of salvation to the world around us. And no matter what we do in life, no matter what stage of life we're in, whether we're young kids, adults, we're in our our elderly years, the golden years, whatever, wherever you're at, the first and utmost job that we have, the most important message we could ever teach is that of the gospel, that of salvation. And so that's why we come here together. We come here today to, to uplift one another, to edify one another, to pray with one another, to gather around the table and partake of the Lord's Supper to proclaim salvation. Where else would you rather be than right here this morning? Let's uh, stand together and sing, You Are the One. Your people praise you. Lift you up and raise you. You are the Holy One. You're the one, you're the only one. Lord, the people love you. Place nobody above you. You are the Holy One. You're the one, you're the only one. Singing hallelujah. All the glory is to you. You are the Holy One. You're the one, you're the only one. Bless your name, Lord Jesus. Only name that frees us. You Holy One, you're the one, you're the only one. We will bless you right here and now. Bless the hills and rocks cry out. You are the Holy One, you're the one, you're the only one. Singing Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. All the glory is to you. You are the Holy One. You're the one, you're the only one. You are the Holy One. You're the one, you're the only one. Please be seated. Good morning. It's good to see everyone here this morning. If you're visiting with us, we really appreciate you being our way. It's a very encouragement to us to have visitors come and visit with us. If you'd like to, there's a blue card behind the pews. If you'd like to fill one of those out, there's some questions on the back if you'd like to check those off. And put that in the collection plate. That that is a great encouragement to us as well. There's a white slip behind the pews, and those are for encouragement. Uh, 
those are where you can write a note of encouragement or a thank you note or something of that nature uh, and put it in the collection plate. We'll make sure it gets to the person that you addressed it to. There's the green uh, sets behind the pews. Those are for prayers that you make a special request for, for someone or a situation that you want the elders to pray for. The elders will be glad to do that and uh, put that in the collection plate as well. We uh, have a few announcements here. Lola Pate <clears throat> will have a shoulder replacement surgery on Wednesday, May 18th at uh, North Central Baptist Hospital. If all goes well, she will go home the next day. It will be at least an eight week recovery period. I can attest to that. I've had both my shoulders worked on. And we will create a meal train for her every day, every other day for two weeks starting the day after she goes home. So be watching for the link. When you sign up, uh, they'll let you know when your day for bringing a meal to her for. Doll Henderson is generally scheduled for heart valve replacement June 8th. We will update it when we find out when the date is going to be assigned to him. Jamie, Jamie Sharp had an MRI on his hand recently. He sees an arterial uh, vein doctor uh, on Monday and they will tell him then what needs to be done for his hand. As you know, he's had a lot of operations on that hand and it's giving him a lot of problems. Or if anything can be done, please pray for good news. Also, please continue praying for the people in Ukraine and those who are in, in harm's way as well. Any ill that we do not know of or we're unaware of and the shut-ins, the missionaries, the military. If you have an opportunity, send a note and a card to the shut-ins. They would really appreciate those cards. There's a parent meeting today after morning's worship to share in the summer youth activities. Uh, this meeting is going to be in the upper room above the fellowship hall. And uh, Robert said, Robert uh, Miller said that if it's going to go until somebody falls out the window. <laughs> but those, uh, please come and learn the opportunities that, in which you and your child can be involved in. There's a luncheon uh, also for Mikey Kendrick. We'll begin at 1230 in the Fellowship Hall as well. And as you know, Mikey uh, has just graduated and uh, they're having a little celebration for him as well. So if you want to be there to encourage him, be a part of that. Uh, he's going to be in the fellowship hall at 1230 today after services. Any other announcements? Let's go to our Father in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for all that you do for us. What an awesome God you are, Father. You answer our prayers so many times. We see you in all the things that you've created. We see you in the words that you've given us in your written word, the Bible. We praise you and glorify you, for you are the great I am. Father, we lay before you those that have we mentioned, Lola Pate, Doyle Henderson, Jamie Short. Please be with them. Bless them, comfort them, and help their situations be taken care of. It is only you can guide and do that will bring comfort to them. Be with us, Father, as we continue this worship for you. For you are the great I am. You are our Father in heaven. And we praise you and glorify you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us your Son, Jesus Christ, as a sacrifice for us. And thank you for raising him from the dead. And thank you for the promise of eternal life that we have laying before us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Holy Lord, most holy Lord, you alone are worthy of my praise. O holy Lord, most holy Lord, with all of my heart I sing. Great are you, Lord. 
worthy of praise, holy and true. Great are you, Lord, most holy Lord. Holy Lord, most holy Lord, you alone are worthy of my praise. O holy Lord, most holy Lord, with all of my heart I sing. Great are you, Lord, worthy of praise, holy and true. Great are you, Lord, most holy Lord. Great are you, Lord, worthy of praise, holy and true. Great are you, Lord, most holy Lord. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could the souls of men. Oh, you rescue the souls of men. Counselor, comforter, keeper, spirit we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost the way. Oh, we've hopelessly lost the way. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Our hearts always hung for Almighty Infinite Father, faithfully loving your own. In our weakness you find us falling before your throne. Oh, we're falling before your throne. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts hunger for. Our hearts always hunger for. Blessed Jesus, come to me, soothe my soul with rays of peace. As I look to you alone, fill me with your love. Mountains high or valleys low, you will never let me go. By your fountain let me drink, Fill my thirsty soul. Glorious, marvelous, grace that rescued me. Holy, worthy is the Lamb who died for me. Blessed Jesus, come to me as I fall down at your feet. 
Let me touch your nail-scarred hands, Jesus I would see. Glorious, marvelous, grace that rescued me. Holy, worthy is the Lamb who died for me. that rescued me. Holy, worthy is the Lamb who died for me. Holy, worthy, holy, worthy, Talk to God. Will you pray with me? Our blessed Heavenly Father, you are truly holy, and we take this time to praise you in song and acts and, and everything we do here. We ask, Father, that you be with us as we go through this time that we have together. And we want to thank you for the church, for the body of Christ. We want to thank you for that and for Brother Miller and the, his lesson this morning. We ask that you be with him and have him given him words that he needs and that everything is done in a manner pleasing to you. Also, Father, we ask at this time that we examine ourselves and we clear our minds as we come before you a few minutes to take a Lord's Supper, let us always set our minds on you, on Jesus on the cross and his death and his crucifixion. We ask that you be with us as we leave here today and keep us safe on the roads home where we live and that we always do the things that be pleasing to you. We ask this, Father, in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. We'll sing this song as we gather around the table. There is a Redeemer, Jesus God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, all.
Last few weeks in our high school class, we've been talking about what it looks like to be a Christian after you've obeyed the gospel and been baptized and start your walk with uh, Christ, what that looks like. And, and one of the things that's uh, paramount to that is remembering the sacrifice that he did uh, on our behalf for that. Um, and, and as a Christian, uh, the whole meaning of it is to be uh, Christ-like. And so uh, today we talked about uh, being that living sacrifice, about uh, constantly uh, giving up of yourself and being there to be used by God. And so uh, Jesus uh, wasn't foreign to this. In, in the, on the Last Supper, he was there, and uh, before he, tor- he was tortured and, and killed on that cross, uh, he knew full well what was going to happen, and he celebrated that. He, he took the bread and the cup and, and, uh, and did the things that he said there for the disciples and, and instituted the, the Lord's Supper for that um, so that we, we, as they did, could remember uh, that uh, precious sacrifice, the sacrifice that's uh, the only way that we have forgiveness of our sins. Um, in the Bible, in... Um, let's see. In Matthew 26 and verse 26, it says, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for that sacrifice. Lord, we know that your body, Lord, that precious body that that, uh, was without defect, Lord, the perfect lamb, Um, was the sacrifice, the the only sacrifice that would be able to take away the sins of this world from us. Lord, and we just want to say thank you for that, Lord, as uh, we live our lives, Lord, and try to be in accordance with your word and to to be a Christian, Lord. We ask that you guide us, Lord, that we remember um, this bread, Lord, that represents that body, Lord, that was hung on that cross. May we remember that, Lord, and that you uh, were beaten, Lord, that you went through all those things, that you were, you were killed on that cross, but the story didn't end there, Lord, because we know that you're alive today. Lord, we thank you so much for that. Lord, please be with us as we take this bread, as we remember that sacrifice. It's through Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.
continue on in Matthew 26 and verse 27. Uh, Jesus there in the upper room through the disciples said, Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many, uh, out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for that precious blood, Lord. We know that in your word you have said, Lord, that it, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Lord, we know that you lived a pure and holy life, that there was no sin among, uh, on you, Lord, but that you took upon the sins of this world. Lord, thank you so much for that sacrifice, for that, that uh, unselfish act of kindness, Lord. We can never repay, but we can accept, Lord, and we, we do, Lord, and we just want to say thank you for that. Lord, as we take this uh, fruit of the vine, which represents to us that blood that was shed, Lord, may we do it in a manner that's pleasing to you. May we always remember, Lord, what that blood has bought us. Through Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Separate and apart from uh, the Lord's Supper, we have an uh, opportunity now to give back a portion of what we've been blessed with uh, monetarily so that we can help uh, further the church's uh, uh, missions uh, abroad and, and also here uh, and around the world and, and spread uh, the love of Christ in, in uh, many different ways. Um, would you pray with me? <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for 
all that you've given us, Lord. We know that all that we have, Lord, comes from you. We know that all the, the things that we have, Lord, are just uh, here for, for tools to be used for your service, Lord. We ask that you um, be with the, the money that's collected here now, Lord, that it's uh, distributed in a manner that's pleasing to you, Lord. Uh, be with those that decide the different uh, uses for it and and uh, be able to um, bring uh, your good news throughout the world, Lord. Um, be with uh, those that give, Lord. Help them to have a cheerful heart. Uh, help us to always remember, Lord, that that uh, without you, we have nothing, Lord. And we just want to say thank you again for all that you do. It's through Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's be standing. If there's any children left that are going to to the children's worship, they can leave now. They can go now to their <clears throat> Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall his praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free for the wonderful grace of Jesus. Reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Higher than the mountain, sparkling like the fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions. Greater for than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise his name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching to all the lost. By it I have been pardoned. Safe to the uttermost. Chains have been torn asunder, giving me liberty for the wonderful grace of Jesus. Reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus. Deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise his name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching the most defiled. 
by it transforming power, making him God's dear child, purchasing peace and heaven for all eternity, and the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. The matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me, broader than the scope of my transgressions. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise his name. Please be seated. Oh, it almost got me. <laughs> almost. Almost. I, uh, I was preaching at a congregation several years ago and uh, they had uh, uh, had me come and, and I was a guest speaker this is in uh, Mountain View up in uh, Colorado and they had uh, like the old stadium seats you know that the seats fold down and stuff well so I'm sitting on this end and uh, I'm sitting there waiting to go up and so I get up and as soon as I get up my it, it snags my pants and it rips my pants and uh, so I was like oh there's strike one <laughs> And then I got up uh, to do the same thing, went to walk up, and I tripped going up the stairs, like legitimately tripped. I was like, this is not going to end well for me. So, you know, if you need the prayers of the congregation, uh, that concludes the lesson. <laughs> so, but uh, uh, I'm a list guy. Are you guys, do you like to make lists? Are you a pros and cons kind of person? I don't know um, why I'm that way, but I, I've been that way for a while. I think it kind of stems back to uh, making, I don't know, decisions for college or even in the military. I've always been one that writes out pros and cons uh, for a lot of the things in my life. I like to make lists of things that need to, to get done. Um, and so that's just kind of the way that I am. And, and I think it, one of it is just a reminder that there's always work that needs to be done. I don't ever want to look down and think there's nothing to do. So I have like an endless amount of lists that I can just choose from at any given time. Uh, to, to go do something. And, you know, in the church, there is never a shortage of work that needs to be done. I'm, a, I'm a also a glass half full kind of person. I like to look at the, the, the optimistic side of things, and there are definitely those that are the, the glass half empty kind of people, and usually glass half empty kind of people are not the kind of people that like to make lists because they look at a list and they think they're never going to get it done. And the reason I bring this up is because in our Christian walk, we're going to be challenged to look through a lens or a perspective of positivity, of a glass half full kind of mentality, a pro and con kind of situation. If you have your Bibles, I want you to, to turn over to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13 is going to be the beginning of 55 verses we are going to look at today. And I'm not even joking. We're looking at 55 verses. So if you take notes, I'm going to try not to go too fast, but keep in mind there's 55 of them. So I'm going to have to kind of go uh, a little fast through some of these and I may not go over a couple of them just because I made a list this morning. I made a list. Uh, but I want to read to a passage of scripture this morning from uh, Acts chapter 13, and this is going to begin in verse 42. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. 
Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It is necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, but since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as it appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. I want you to notice some of the, the narrative that's here. We're told that they uh, came to hear the word of the Lord, and the word was being spread throughout all the region. Verse 50, But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women, and the chief men of the city raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium. And we'll get back to verse 52 here in just a little bit. Paul, in his ministry, told us that he was persecuted many, many times. Actually, he tells Timothy that anyone that's going to be a Christian is going to be persecuted. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But Paul was kind of a pro versus a pro guy. You know what I'm talking about there, a pro versus pro? Because sometimes you think pro versus con. Paul didn't really see the con side of things. It kind of reminds me of the way that Ann and I, when we were going through our selection process to, to come to Texas, we were ending our time in Colorado, and we were trying to decide if Texas is where we wanted to spend uh, our, our retirement, to kind of set roots in Texas. So we had our options. Ann still had one more tour she was going to have to do, and I was already out, but we had some options between Missouri, Virginia, and Texas. And so we started setting out our pro and con list. What are the pros of Texas? What are the cons? What are the pros of Virginia? Cons. What are the pros of Missouri? Cons. And we would write it out. And the, the more we would always go back to Texas, the cons started to even look like pros. Isn't that kind of weird how it is? You know, most people might look at Texas and they say, oh, man, it gets hot. We're not even in June yet, and we've already had how many days of 100-degree weather? We're not even in the critical days of summer yet, and it's already cooking eggs on the sidewalk time. But then we looked at Virginia, and I was stationed in D.C. for a while, and it gets cold, and I don't like the winters, so that hot kind of turned into a pro. Even though it might be uncomfortable at times, it is a pro because I'll endure it for the other good things. So anyway, by the end of the conversation, Texas was pro versus pro, and that was where we wanted to come. Paul, and in, in what we see in, in all this literature as Luke, Luke records it, is you see Paul saying things like, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ, Jesus will suffer persecution, but through the same teaching, the same idea, he is grateful to be able to do it. In his second letter to the Corinthians, he says, Above all, though, it is the church that I worry about the most. Even Peter, Peter would remind the congregation in 1 Peter 4, verse 16, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. And so, Paul, in looking at this, you know, I, was, I, just, this, I, I read this verse on Monday. Verse 47, it says, I've set you as a light to the Gentiles, you should be for salvation. And I was like, man, what a, what a charge that is to know that God has given them this responsibility to, to, to get the word out, to teach all nations, to, to preach to the world Christ. And it's the same commission that we've been given today, but Paul was faced with a lot of of persecution is as you go through the, the the passages of scripture especially in acts and and you can go to second corinthians you can go to where paul talks about the persecutions that he faced and go back with many of them kind of fact check it <laughs> with acts where it tells the account of it but he endured a lot of persecution he to paul could have looked at it this way paul could have said man i don't know i gave up everything for this i gave up everything to preach the gospel and how do i get repaid how does god reward me in acts chapter 9 verse 23 his life was threatened in damascus has your life ever been threatened before in acts chapter 9 verse 29 his life was threatened again while he was in jerusalem he was persecuted and run out of antioch and Pis uh, pisidia in acts chapter 13 verse 50 
In Iconium, he faced possible stoning, Acts chapter 14, verse 5. Later on in the same chapter, chapter 14, verse 19, in fact, Paul is stoned and left for dead in Lystra. He was opposed and made the center of controversy in Acts 15, verse 11. He experienced the loss of his close friend and co-worker, Barnabas in Acts chapter 15, verse 39, he was beaten with rods and imprisoned while in Philippi, Acts 16, verse 23. In fact, a hundred, was it 155 times, I think it was, he was beaten. 155 stripes total. He was cast out of Philippi, Acts chapter 16, verse 39. His life was threatened in Thessalonica, Acts 17. Verse 5, 7, and again in verse 10. He was forced out of Berea, Acts chapter 17, verses 23 through 14. He was mocked in Athens, chapter 17, verse 18. So he's been threatened, he's been run out, he's been facing the possibility of being stoned. He was actually stoned. He was beaten with rods, he was cast out, his life has been threatened, he's been forced out of towns, he's been mocked, and he was taken to court at the judgment seat in Corinth, Acts chapter 18, verse 12, he was opposed by the silversmith in Ephesus, Acts 19, verse 23 through 41, plotted against by the Jews while he was in Greece, Acts 20, verse 3. He was apprehended by the mob. He was chased down by a mob of people that hated him in Acts 21, 27 through 30. In Acts 22, verse 24, he was arrested and detained by the Romans. He barely escaped being scourged in Acts chapter 22, verses 24 through 29. He was rescued from the Sanhedrin's mob action in chapter 23, verses 1 through 8. And then there was an assassination plot against him. They sought out to kill him. Had a plan, Acts chapter 23, verses 12 through 22. And then he had a two-year imprisonment. He's gone before the judge. He's had to get, uh, get arrested. He's gone before the different councils. And he spends two years in prison in Caesarea in Acts chapter 23, verses 33 through 27, verse 2. He was shipwrecked on the island of Malta in Acts chapter 27, Verses 41 through chapter 28, verse 1, he snuff, uh, suffered a snake bite. In Acts chapter 28, verses 3 through 5. And then you get to Acts 28, and he hits his first Roman imprisonment. Beaten, scourged, arrested, constantly mocked, ridiculed, run out of towns, run out of cities. I don't think there's anyone here, if I were to say, say give me a show of hands of anyone that's ever had to face persecution such as this, raise your hand, and if you have, I'm truly sorry that you've had to endure that. But I think sometimes we, today, we get into this idea that, man, woe is me, and I can't believe all the stuff that's going on, and, and, and I just, sometimes I just want to give up, and, and is it really worth it? And, and we allow things to get in our way, and, and, and we look at pros and cons, and so many times in life as it is, Satan allows us to be overwhelmed by the cons. But what I want you to realize, and this is why I took us to Acts chapter 13 this morning, because Paul understood that he had a mission. He understood that he had a message that was not his to give. Remember, Jesus throughout his ministry, anytime Jesus was, was asked why he's doing it and what is the message, he would always say, I have been sent by the Father. Jesus always kept in vision the task before him, and he never once forgot who it was that sent him with the words of life. And so everything was about the Father. Paul here understands that there's going to be persecution in his life. He understands people are not going to like him. He understands that he's going to go to jail. He understands he's going to get beat. I wonder if when he was being stoned, if maybe his mind didn't turn to Stephen, in fact. Because it wouldn't have been too many years prior that that happened. But as we've been promised in scripture and this is where the, the fine line gets had to be drawn sometimes because prosperity gospel will teach you that you know everything is going to be okay for you when you're in the church that whenever you become a believer 
uh, of Christ that life is going to begin to turn around for you, that you're going to have an abundant amount of physical blessings and material blessings in life, and that happiness is something that will just kind of flood in in you. And if you have sadness and grief and doubt and frustration and anxiety, that's because you yourself are the cause of those things. It's not God. And, and, and you know, it's, 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 but it's because you need to be considering uh, where your walk in faith is because if you're a true member of the church, you don't suffer those things. But that's not what Paul teaches. That's not what God teaches. God teaches, in fact, that if you're going to follow him, you're going to be persecuted. And so for every Christian, we cannot be a glass half empty kind of person because if you do, life will certainly give you a lot of emptiness to choose from. Rather, I want you to look at what happens because we went through a list of 24 passages of Scripture in Acts in which Paul was persecuted, in which something happened to Paul. People were out to get Paul. They were seeking out Paul. They hurt Paul. They damaged Paul. I sat down. I said, there's got to be there's got to be something else because Paul knew the he knew that the, the the blessings spiritually far outweighed any material persecution. And so I said, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna sit down. I'm gonna make a list of all the all the times that in spite of all the bad things that happened, the truth was preached. Because that's where Paul found gain. That's where Paul found value is as you you may have stoned me. But before you stoned me, I preached the message. And when I got up, I went to the next town and I preached the gospel. And so I said, man, there's got to be just an enormous amount of, of good that outweighs the bad here. And so that's what you see that begins to happen. Because in spite of everything that happens to Paul, the gospel is preached. Acts chapter 9, verse 20, immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. Acts chapter 9, again, verse 29, and he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. Acts chapter 13, verse 5, and when they arrived in uh, Salamea, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. Go down to verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 12, then the proconsul believed when he saw what he had been doing and was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Again, Acts chapter 13, verses 14 through 31, while in Antioch and in Pisidia here, Paul delivers a sermon where he proclaims with boldness in verse 38 and 39, therefore let it be known through this man that though this man has preached to you the forgiveness of sins, and by him everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. In spite of persecution, in spite of what's coming, Paul continues to just preach. The very next week, we see down in verse 44 of chapter 13 that the whole city came together to hear the word of God. Can you imagine saying that, that we're going to, to, to start hosting events and, and next week we come here and the entire town of Pleasanton is here to listen to the Word of God? How amazing would that be? Again, in verse 49, we see the gospel is being preached, and in doing so, the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. Not the words of Paul, the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. Acts chapter 14, verse 3, while staying a long time in Iconium, they, Paul and Barnabas, spoke boldly in the Lord. Again, in verse 7, and they were preaching the gospel there. In Lystra, we're told in verse 8 that a certain man without strength in his feet, crippled from his mother's womb and who had never walked, heard Paul doing what he was preaching. Preaching in verse 9, and we're told that Paul saw him intently listening and watching. So Paul called for the man to stand up, and the result, more preaching. In verses 14 through 18. They preached the gospel in Derby and made many disciples. Acts chapter 14, verse 21. They strengthened the souls of the disciples and exhorted them to continue in the faith. 
Acts chapter 14, verse 22, telling them, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. This is Paul. This is Barnabas. This is them enduring persecution, being beaten, being stoned, being whipped, being chased out of towns, still saying there's work to do. We preached. We got to teach them the gospel here. Let's go to the next town because there's a synagogue there, and I want to reason with the Jews. In Acts 14, verse 25, they preached the word in Perga. They spoke to the church in Antioch of all that God had done and that He had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 14, verse 27. In chapter 15, verse 35, again in Antioch, after delivering the letter in which the council of Jerusalem had sent them to do, we're told Paul and Barnabas were teaching and preaching the word of the Lord along with many others. That's the discipleship on display. Going back now, seeing the people that they had seen this first time and watching them grow and encouraging them and exhorting them and challenging them to do better, to continue on despite what might be happening to them and what would surely happen to those who would walk in accordance to God's will. In Acts chapter 16, Timothy joins them. And we're told that the churches were strengthened in the faith in verse 5. They preached to Lydia and other women in Philippi, Acts chapter 16, verses 12 through 15, resulting in the baptism of her and her entire household, verse 15. After being arrested there in Philippi, they're cast into jail where both Paul and Silas, in verse 25, are praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. A perfect example of how singing is, in fact, teaching like we're told in Colossians 3.16. Even while they're in prison, in chains, feet bound, they're singing and praying because they know they have an audience that needs to hear about the life-saving grace, mercy, and forgiveness of our Lord and Father, of Jesus Christ. They preach Christ in Thessalonica in Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 4. And then down in verses 10 through 12, they preach to the Bereans. In Acts 17, 16 through 34, in Athens, Paul preached to the Oropagus about the one true God unknown to them before, but then introduced to who God really is. In Acts chapter 18, every single Sabbath while they were in Corinth, Paul taught in the synagogues. Keep in mind, this is while they're being chased. All of this is happening while Paul is being persecuted. What you're watching here is you're watching that list that was so heavy at the beginning of persecution and stoning and being beaten with rods begin to lose its weight under what happens when the gospel is being preached because the persecution is not greater than the message. And you see a weight being lifted because of the power of what God is doing in this ministry. Again, reasoning with the Jews in the synagogue in Antioch, Acts chapter 18, verse 19. And then down in verse 23, he visits his brethren in Galatia, and Phrygia, and he strengthens them. In Ephesus, he preached the baptism of Christ, a forgiveness to 12 disciples who had not fully understood the gospel message. So here he is again, Paul reoccurring, going back through some of these places, and he meets 12 men, and they were baptized by the baptism of John. He asked him, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And they said, we don't know what this Holy Spirit is. And what does he do? He preaches to them. He tells them about Jesus. These are people who knew who Jesus was, but they didn't have a full grasp of the message. The same time Paul is teaching these 12, we're told that there's a man named Apollos that's being instructed by Priscilla and Aquila. Because he, too, was teaching something inaccurately. There's a teaching going on. And then for three months, in Acts chapter 19, verse 8, for three months he preached boldly in the synagogue in Ephesus, reasoning and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. 
Look at this next one, though. This next one is, I had to stop. I got here, and I was just like, this is amazing. If, if I was trying to convince somebody to go on a missions trip with me, and, and, and you know, I have to you know, give the disclaimer. I, nobody gave me this disclaimer, and Rashish, if you're watching, shame on you. Um, nobody gave me the disclaimer before I went to India that there were spiders and, and cobras that wanted to kill me, that there were animals that wanted to eat me. And that when, you know, that, that when you go to see monkeys, because they're wild monkeys, that, that when you get up to them close, that there's no gate that stops them from just chasing you. Nobody told me of the warnings, and had they told me the warnings, I may have said, well, let me rethink this. Now, Anne did say, isn't there human trafficking going on in India? And I said, um, I don't think I'm what they're looking for. But there's a lot of cons. I remember asking somebody to go with me one time. You want to go to India? There's, oh, man, you know, there's, there's, there's cobras. We're going to be going out to the, the wetlands. So there's that. There's mongoose and crazy spiders that when you're sleeping at night, they just come right on. And I mean, they just, no thanks, I'm good. Well, let me get to the good part because the good part is when you get there, in 18 days, we're going to go visit about 32 different towns. And we're going to preach a sermon, and we're going to do a class every morning, every afternoon, and every evening. And we're going to introduce the, 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 the gospel message of Christ to hundreds of people that have never heard it before. And we're going to give them hope. And if they can endure having a spider in the house with them at night that wants to kill them, then I can endure it too. If they can survive a night when the air conditioner goes out, I can do it too. But look at what happens here. I had to stop after this one because the evidence was just so overwhelming that the, 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 the pros outweighed the cons so much that the cons turned into pros. Just like Paul said they would. But look at what happens here. Acts chapter 19. Look at verse 10. Speaking of his, his, his teaching daily in the school of, of Tyrannus, It says, and this continued for two years. So he is teaching in this school for two years. So that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jew and Greek. You know, I'd never really really focused too much about this uh, before. I knew it was there, but I never really focused on this as much. Because, again, the topic I'm thinking of is, is pros versus cons. Glass empty, glass full. What's going on here? Perspective. And I remember reading this verse again. And looking at it and saying, verse 10, okay, so all who dwelt in Asia. All who dwelt in Asia. Well, if you go back to chapter 16, and you look at verse 6, this is what we're told. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. So they weren't even allowed to go into Asia. They weren't even allowed to go minister. For what reason? I don't know. After they came to Mycenae, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So they're trying to do this thing. They're trying to, they're trying to minister. They're trying to set forth a plan. They've got their list. They've got to go to this town, to this town, to this region. Holy Spirit comes to them at one point and says, No, you can't go into Asia. I need you to go do this instead. Now, how many times in our life when we had a plan, did we let that kind of foil everything and say, well, crap, you know, we can't do it, and then nothing's going to get done, you know? I remember when, when, when the pandemic hit, we were supposed to go to Burma again for the, for, for the second year, and we couldn't do it. Well, well I guess everyone in Burma is going to die and never get sal- you know, salvation taught to them. That's how, you know, it's, it, you can easily just get soured when God says, no, this isn't the plan that, that I have for you. There's a plan, and you're going to teach, but here they could have thrown in the towel and said, well, fine, you don't want me to go to Asia? I don't care about them. Because that's an attitude that even today we suffer with. But look at what happens. You, you go just a few chapters over later on in the ministry, and the very place that they weren't even allowed to go into because they followed the will of the Spirit, the will of God, rather than their own devices, because of that, what ends up happening? 
all of Asia heard the word. Had they been left up to their own devices, maybe only 50%, maybe less. Maybe they wouldn't have had that encounter with Lydia. Maybe they wouldn't have had that encounter at the Philippian jail. But because they kept their eye on the mission that God had imparted to them, through their persecution, through that jail sentence, somewhere along the line, because of that, everyone, everyone in Asia heard the word. That is amazing. And that is the message. That is the message. We never stop preaching. Never stop focusing on the doors of ministry that the Spirit is opening up for you, for me. Never become distracted from our goal. And that goal is what Paul kept clinging on to. You go back to the original text here in Acts chapter 13. He says, I, knowing that they're now going to go teach the Gentiles, I have set you as a light to the to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. His goal was one to preach. He had a message. He had to preach it. Nothing was going to stop him. Whatever God opened, whatever door was presented, he was going to go through it. But then finally, the second one was this, and this is again, we're going to finish with verse 52. So he wasn't accepted everywhere. Verse 51, they shook off the dust. But look at 52, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And that is what we do. We go, and we preach, and we make disciples, and we fill those disciples with joy. That's the same message that is preached in 1 John chapter 1, verse 4. He says, we write these things so your joy may be full, and that you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5. The fruit of the Spirit. That's the mission. It's such an amazing list when I look at it. Because I looked at it the same way. I looked at it to the point where everything that was negative, everything that I would see that was bad, everything that, that, that would stop me from wanting to preach soon became the very reason why he had to preach. Because Satan was going to do everything he could to stop him because the message that he had was too important. The message that we have today is the very same message. The message is too important not to preach, not to teach, not to get out. And so that's our commission. That's our goal. And that's what we do. I'm excited. Again, I, say, I know you guys hear me say this, and it's not just because that's my job. It's not just because I'm supposed to say this kind of stuff. I am excited about the ministry opportunities that we have in Pleasanton. We are a community that is surrounded by over 13,000 people. In this room, less than 1% of that population is spoken for, which means that we have over 99% of the community that we still have to go reach and preach and teach and love and tell them about the joy of Christ and the message of the cross. Let's get on it. Let's do it. Our kids are going to, we got a lot of, we got a lot coming up for you kids over the summer. I wish the summer was longer. School teachers wish it was shorter. Well, no, they probably, <laughs> probably wish it was longer too. <laughs> we have a lot of work to do. Maybe you're here this morning, you need the prayers of the congregation. Maybe you haven't been uh, uh, focused. Maybe you've kind of looked at your life and your ministry and the things that you do and your teaching opportunities and the opportunity to be a part of something, and you've looked at your life and you saw a glass that's half empty. There's something always missing. Maybe you need the prayers of the congregation today so you can change your perspective to see that glass half full and say, why stop here? Let's keep pouring. Let's keep going. To look at a perspective and say, regardless of what I think my ministry should be, I'm going to set out and just minister to the people that God opens up to me. I'm going to follow those doors, and I'm going to let the words that come out of my mouth be nothing but Christ and Him crucified. If you need that prayer today, we can pray with you. Maybe you're ready to be baptized. Maybe you're ready to be a part of this body. We can baptize you today. We can put you in the water, but God can add you to the church. And through Christ's sacrifice, your sins can be forgiven. Maybe you're watching and you, you want to study. Maybe you're ready to, to be baptized. We can put you in contact with a study. We can put you in contact with a local church. Whatever it is, though, don't stop. There's still work that needs to be done.
The message is yours. The invitation is yours. While together we stand and sing. Hide me, O oh my Savior, hide me in thy holy place, resting there beneath thy glory. Oh, let me see thy face. Hide me, hide me, O oh, blessed Savior, hide me, O oh, Savior, keep me safely, O oh Lord, with Thee. Hide me when the storm is raging. Life's troubled sea, like a dove on ocean's billows. Oh, let me fly to thee. Hide me, hide me, oh, blessed Savior. We sit down. Hey, Ray, why'd we sit down? <laughs> Listen, I thought we were going to have a closing prayer now, so I'm going I'm to be leading the closing prayer. Wasn't that an awesome sermon, though? Good job, Robert. Appreciate it. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful that you've again allowed us into this place. We thank you for the great lesson that was preached to us this morning. We see the wisdom in your word. We're so thankful for the word. Thank you for the mystery that was, that was hidden for many years when you gave the promise to Abraham and even before that, Father, that all the nations of the earth would be blessed. We see it revealed when Paul and Peter started preaching the gospel to the Gentile people, we're so thankful that you included us. Father, we thank you for the, the ways you work. Even when the hardships come, the persecutions, your gospel is spread, sometimes even faster than we know, Father, in many cases, faster than it would have otherwise. We see your wisdom. Help us, Father, when persecutions come and hardships come, not to give up, but to just look for things positive in those things. Help us to live the Christian life, a quiet and peaceful life that others can see the advantage in being a Christian. Help us to spread the word when we need to open our mouths. Help us to do that. Help us to 
appreciate the examples that we see in the Bible. Help us to appreciate the ones that have gone before us in our own lives that presented the word to us too. For those that led great examples for us. Those that were in our, in our lives for a very short time, Father, we, we thank you for sending them to us. Help us to be around people that share the same faith as us. Help us to want to be around each other. Help us to come back every point of time, Father. Help us to get into your word and study. We want to be pleasing to you. We know we're going to fall and we're, we need someone there to help us up. At times, Father, it's, it's our brothers and sisters around us. Father, we know that we can't get there alone and we need your grace. We need your mercy. Help us to always be aware of that. Help us to never give up when we fall, but look for help. We know that you're there, Father. Help us to be there for our brothers and sisters. Continue with us on this road, Father. Always forgive us. Please forgive us. Encourage us. Help us through this coming week. Help us to be good examples. We ask all this in your son's name, that perfect sacrifice that you sent many years ago, but is still as relevant as he ever was. Thank you for his resurrection and his hope, our hope because of that. All this we pray in his name. Amen.